My guest today is JD Marry Me. JD, how you doing? Good to see you again, David. Thanks. Welcome back to the show. It's been a couple years. Yeah, about that. And uh, I understand you're doing a lot of work with blockchain. Is that true? Uh, that's true. Yeah. Been playing a lot with it for about the last, I have you really put it all together. It's been a few years, but mm -hmm. really in the last uh, three years, we've we've been working with customers and doing some blockchain implementations. That's probably when people just started discovering blockchain and realizing that there's some power in it, right? Yeah, kind of. I mean, there are other people that have been doing Bitcoin mining for years because everybody, when you say blockchain, um, a lot of customers will go, what? And you go, Bitcoin? Oh, yeah, I know what Bitcoin oh, is. it's a get-rich-quick scheme, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And even as much as five years ago, people were trying to do that, but the, the hardware to actually mine Bitcoin uh, has gotten more and more expensive and more uh, exotic until now. It's really difficult to make any money on Bitcoin per se. All right. Well, can we define what is blockchain? Uh, so the short thing, if you really want to think of it this way, it's really a distributed ledger. So we have multiple people that can look at it, it gets replicated, and the idea at the end of the day is it's a distributed database that can be built on untrusted hardware, hmm. but build a trust environment. That's generally speaking what we use a blockchain for. There's a few things that have, have really kind of permutated since then. Uh, done by different financial houses and there's offerings now by IBM and in addition to Bitcoin and Ethereum and so forth. But generally speaking, that's what it is. Distributed database, mm -hmm. trust, uh, and gives you certain things you don't get with traditional databases. Okay. And how are you using, what are some practical applications that you've seen with blockchain? Well, if, if you look at some of the quintessential examples and a couple of these we, we kind of experimented with, think of it where if I was going to transfer title so you and I decide to exchange of, uh, like a house, house or, or a like car that. or something like that. Right. We want that to be public record. Yes. So I give you some money. You give me title to a piece of land, for example. Mm -hmm. usually, later there's on, a, usually there's a bank involved. There is or an escrow officer, right? Okay. And there's, there's documentation involved. But if there was a public blockchain that everybody could look at and go, yes, JD gave David money and David gave him the title and forever, ever, that's going to be it until it gets sold again. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the quintessential case. Okay. If you look at some of the customer things that we've done, though, um, some of them include uh, like a travel company in Australia who is looking to do reconciliation amongst their different trading partners. Okay. So, for example, uh, the, the case they had is if you go and buy a discounted hotel room, you could go out there to Expedia right now and go buy it. And what ends up happening is you pay them money. They ultimately pay Marriott money. Um, however, a lot of times those reconciliations take forever because there are separate databases involved. Sure. But what if we all had a database that we trusted hmm. and we could all go to for the reconciliation? So that's kind of what we used for blockchain uh, with that uh, with Webjet at that point, that customer, hmm. which is a public case. You can go out and see it. What, what's it called? Webjet. Webjet, okay. Yes, they're kind of, think of them like uh, Expedia for Asia Pac, Australasia. Okay. Uh, what else? What else is in? Let's find, uh, one we of, have. I, you know, I, I hear about blockchain, and I, the, uh, like most people, I only know the Bitcoin example. Yeah, fair enough. Um, we we have a really fun one that we're working on right now, where I can't say the name, but okay. think of it this way: that if uh, right now, if you are trying to repair a vehicle somewhere in the Middle East, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and let's say a handle breaks. Well, right now, if you don't carry that inventory, you'd have to go say, hey, go, go get that handle and ship it to me, and it might take weeks to get there. Yes. Well, but now you say, well, we have all these fun things around additive manufacturing. The, the common saying is 3D printing. Okay. But what if I could just 3D print something right there where the vehicle is? All well, right. wouldn't that be great? That would be great. But the problem is then someone had to design that particular part and someone's going to monetize in that particular part. Okay. Right? So we don't want to just copy the files to 3D print it to everybody in the world because there are licensing things involved. Hmm. But now what if I throw in a blockchain, use it as an attestation mechanism to say that someone says, I need to have this part, and it says, great, this person paid for that part, and now they printed that part, and all that gets put on a trusted chain that everybody participating can agree that's our distributed trust. So there's somewhere there's a, uh, a distributed database of how much money is owed and how much money is paid for, in this case, the design of a part. And whether it was actually printed or not. Okay. And you could even put in the, the specifications about when it was printed. What was the temperature like? Hmm. You know, what were the tolerances at the particular time? So if that part fails, you know who printed it and what might might have happened at that point. Why do we need a blockchain for that? Why can't we just use a client server or just a, a single 
server and a single database for that? That is a great question. And uh, l let me start with a quintessential one also from finance. So okay. if you go and you, you get paid, I assume, right? I hope I do. <laughs> yeah, sweet. And you take that. And Not you put for your, this interview, but for <laughs> You put money general. into a bank. Yes. Okay, so what, what, what gives you a level of trust that you know the bank actually is going to save that when you put in your million dollars from your last paycheck that it's actually there? Uh, well, for me, it's because I've noticed that they put it in last month and the month before that. So I have some history. Yep. That so I you trust the bank at that point. Right. Right. But if you get into a group of partners doing mm -hmm. something and you're trying to have a level of trust, yes. blockchain lets you to have a shared database that all of us have a stake in. And if all of us, if, if any one of us tries to invalidate something, everybody else knows that they're invalidating it. Hmm. So well, instead of in, what you you trust a bank because of the bank's name, because they have federal oversight, you know, a lot of things. Yep. yep. In a blockchain environment, though, for a lot of these things, you don't have those luxuries. You you're not just going to say I'm going to trust so and so. Instead, you trust the fact that we're all participating in the database, hmm. and we all have a financial stake, or we have a financial stake in ensuring that we're all consistent. If one of them tries to um, forge something, we're all going to know about it. That's what a did, uh, blockchain gives me. Okay, so blockchain is more open than a bank. It yes. doesn't have this, this trusted authority like the U.S. government, for example, for the banks. But it does Right, have if you a, look yeah. at Bitcoin, there is no trusted authority. Yeah. It is a worldwide is, database. Is the fact that it's in our own best interest to keep it secure, and keep or not secure, but to keep it consistent. Exactly, and Bitcoin mining is all about having that distributed level of trust. Okay. Yeah, so um, those are some examples. And there are many uh, cases where you would not use a blockchain. So anytime mm -hmm. a customer comes in and says, hey, we want to do blockchain because they heard it on TechCrunch or something else, right? Yeah. And it's the cool word right now. We read it on um, the airplane magazine. Exactly. Come and back and tell everybody. It's good for a five-point stock bump, you know. <laughs> but they go, hey, we want to use blockchain. And we want to spin one up and we want to totally control it. That's the antithesis of a blockchain. Oh, uh, they want their own blockchain. Exactly. If that's the case, then it's you're better off just doing a database at that point. If you look at it, what do you need? What does a blockchain give you? It gives you distributed trust on untrusted systems, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. It's all about, generally, generally speaking, value transfer. Mm -hmm. So like Bitcoin is about transferring uh, currency, right. right? cryptocurrency. Or attestation, proving that you and I did something and the world can look at it. The other common values of blockchain is transparency. Okay. So anytime someone says, and we want to keep it all secret on the blockchain, we want to en encrypt it using blockchain, encryption is the antithesis of blockchain. Hmm. Blockchain, generally speaking, is about being transparent about everything on the blockchain. Does that mean nothing is encrypted on a blockchain? That's a, that's a good question. Now, there are new blockchains now where there are elements that can be protected between two different partners on the blockchain. Um, but those are actually modifications to the original blockchain philosophy, hmm, okay. where I might actually have. What we end up doing, generally speaking, is putting metadata on the blockchain, saying this thing happened. David and JD exchanged and did a property exchange, money for property. Okay. But all the details might be stored off-chain and a okay. reference to something on-chain that, that proves that it happened. But all the details are okay, off chain. So the blockchain and only you and I know. transparent. It's just us. It's something that has to keep made secret. We put somewhere else. Generally speaking, yeah. And the and the evolution of blockchains now are going from what's called proof of work, which is what Bitcoin started. Okay. Proof of work is all about having minor nodes and and expending a lot of compute cycles, and that's how what we get in exchange for the trust mechanism. Hmm. Uh, I'll describe that more if you want in a second. But more and more, we're going to a proof of authority, or what's called proof of stake where it might be, if you want to use an, an analogy, it's almost like having a, putting up a bond. So if you and I both put up a million dollar bond to go have a blockchain together, okay. and you happen to violate that particular um, chain, you try to forge something, okay. you lose your million dollar bond. I see. So you're incented to, to do it. But that, okay. in case you have a stake involved. In proof of work, what uh, the way it all works is it's, all these nodes are competing for who can earn more Bitcoin in the case of the Bitcoin world. Hmm, okay. And we don't care what the transactions are. We're just working really hard to win the next round of Bitcoin to earn for ourselves. And trust comes out of that. Hmm. One thing that um, I have a trouble getting my head around is that blockchain is essentially a bunch of nodes, it's a bunch of computers. Yes. Uh, do those, if I want to enter into a, a blockchain transaction, uh, or if you and I want to ha have a blockchain, do, do we utilize existing nodes or do we create our own set of nodes? How, yeah, great how question. does that work? You could actually do both, but generally okay. speaking, if you wanted to participate and do an exchange, you want to go buy a bunch of Bitcoin. 
you do not have to create a node to okay. go do that, that. That infrastructure already exists. Yes, because the one thing I should be clear on is there are public blockchains. Okay. So like Ethereum has a public blockchain. So those Bitcoin ones, has a those public would, blockchain. Those would be much simpler just to participate in those. Yes, but and they're, they're all this, over the world. But if I wanted to sell you this device right here and you were going to pay me $100 for that mm -hmm. and we wanted to do the transaction on a blockchain, yes. would we participate in the one that already exists or would we create our own to do that? You would you would do it on the one that exists almost certainly, okay. right? Because you're trying to prove to the world that this actually happened. I see. But if you do have customers that are trying to do something, let's say this, this 3D part printing I was describing. Okay. So who are the actors who are going to participate? They're the designers, mm -hmm. they're the people that print it, um, and there are different consumers of that. Let's say it's um, you're doing something with the DOD, okay. and there are four different branches, right? So four different branches plus the people that license and, and create these things. We've got five actors now involved. Mm -hmm. So they might create a private blockchain Okay. Amongst each other, and when they to go create, do this what does thing. that mean to create a private blockchain? Are they going to spin up a bunch of servers? They will spin uh, spin up a bunch of not spinach, probably not spin spinach, up, but yeah, spin they will bring up, <laughs> they'll spin up a number of nodes. Okay. Amongst each other, because those are actually forging the blocks on the blockchain, and then they will agree between yes. themselves that those nodes are our blockchain nodes. Correct. So they might do proof of stake. And meaning how, that how they all, that again, they might actually say, we're all going to put up the equivalent of a bond or they're going to be trusted nodes that we, we will guarantee trust in. Okay. And if we violate that, then there's some kind of penalty to be paid. Well, who enforces but they would, that? Well, amongst each other then, right? So if there are five partners and one of them violates, the other four have some kind of remuneration for actually the violation. Okay. In a proof of, of work world, like the public blockchains, mm -hmm. um, the transactions just get invalidated, the ones that attempted to get forged. Hmm, okay. Yeah, if that makes sense. I know clear as mud. Well, let's, well, let's no, put it this... Well, the reason it's unclear to me is because when you say something is invalid and, and we have, uh, if somebody tries to, I don't know, cheat the other four people mm -hmm. or renege on a bet, uh, renege on their investment, then uh, typically there has to be some government involved to say, well, I, I would sue you. Yes, and right. And I can't sue you unless I have some sort of force behind me to, to make sure that That's why, like through. a bond, if you put up a million-dollar bond and the other four know that you, you violated it, you lose the million-dollar bond. That's, the, that's okay. the enforcement. In a public blockchain, the way okay. it works is y you will, by, by definition, that nobody ever has a majority, a slim majority, of the mining nodes. Okay. So let's say there are three of us involved in a blockchain. We each have... A, three nodes out of a nine node blockchain. Okay. So the if you try to forge something, you've got your three nodes that uh, all, both of us will actually know that you forged it. No one has, if anybody has an overwhelming majority, they could actually forge something on the public blockchain and, and get away with bad acting at that point. Okay. So on the public blockchains, no one ever has a majority by design. If they do, that's a big problem. Okay, and that, that's, that helps me. Because yes. I think the whole point of this is to sort of democratize things like banking and uh, transactions, which are typically over, overseen by banks and government, which we see yes. as trusted authorities. But history has shown that sometimes, not always, sometimes we can't trust them. That's, and so that's there's some right. suspicion around that. And yes. we're trying to get, the, get, get away from that. Yes. I think that's the goal of blockchain ultimately. Yes. Yes. It, it's, yeah. it's the but, ability to have a, a trusted system on a worldwide system of untrusted nodes in the case That's of Bitcoin specifically. We, we need specifically. that trust for it to work. Yes. So that, that these trusted authorities like governments and banks, they have to be replaced by something that That's provides right. that trust. And the incentive to, to have all this, this massive hardware, which is generating all the trust, is that anybody who actually uh, wins the, the mining race, okay. and I'll tell about it in just a second, um, they earn some Bitcoin. So they're financially incented by Bitcoin um, to win the race, so to speak. Hmm. Now here's what happens. If you and I, of, of when we're all in a blockchain, blocks are being forged. So transactions are going in blocks and they're linked all together. Hence okay. the term blockchain. Got it. Okay. For any given block that's being mined, uh, the way it works, and this is, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around if you're not used to it, but what's happening is you have to generate a, a type of hash and everybody else is trying to generate the same type of hash as you are. And whoever generates it, because it's non-deterministic, whoever generates that hash first wins that particular round and mm -hmm. wins a certain level of Bitcoin, a certain amount of Bitcoin. Hmm. I know it sounds really strange. It's but, a contest. But it, 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 it mat what matters is all this hardware is trying to generate hashes as fast as they possibly can. Hmm. 
computationally intensive. Right. Okay. Which is so, why, they're, why they're stealing all of our Azure nodes. <laughs> let's hope. This. Are they paying us for it? That'd be awesome. Well, we've got a lot of free <laughs> programs out there. That, that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you really, up for you us. really got to be GPUs or ASICs <laughs> these days to right. go fast <laughs> enough to go do it. But um, if you win the race, then you do the next block. So you have all this, all these people competing to win some some Bitcoin. And in exchange for that, you're getting all this massive hardware, which can rapidly forge new blocks, mm. which lets Bitcoin grow mm. across the world. So they're, they're kind of loosely related. Okay. But the interesting thing is that someday, and there's, it's going to be, I forget the exact year, there's a, there's a cap on how much Bitcoin can actually be mined. And it's like 21 million Bitcoin. Okay. So when that day comes, and those miners are no longer incented to actually mine for Bitcoin anymore because the limit has been reached, It'll then, then we'll see what happens at that point. Yeah, that's There's the, different that's the schemes. Event yeah, like in, in, in Ethereum, for example, another public blockchain, uh, there's something called gas. And in gas, what happens when a transaction happens, in order for it to go through the system and get executed, there has to be a certain amount of gas associated with it. And the gas is, is paid in something called Ether, which is on the Ethereum blockchain. Mm. So you're not competing to mine anymore. You're, you're essentially saying, I will calculate this transaction for you, I will let this transaction happen because I can collect the gas on it. And it's more of a long-term play on okay. that public blockchain as opposed to Bitcoin, which is mining Bitcoin. Interesting. Yes. Fascinating world, actually. This is a lot to swallow. Yes, it's a uh, lot. Are there this could be a five-part series, David. It could be. Well, <laughs> let's, uh, I, I think there's a lot of people that have heard uh, about blockchain but don't really have an understanding of it. Hopefully, they'll have a better understanding after watching this. What will be the next step? Where can they learn more? Uh, well, there's uh, you can go out to the Ethereum Foundation, so Ethereum.org. There are uh, there's a lot of information about there. You can stand up um, your own Ethereum blockchain. You can even stand up your own Bitcoin blockchain if you want. You can go out to Azure. There are templates to actually spin up some test dev test kind of blockchains. Mm -hmm. We had something called Project Bletchley, which I, it might be named that still, but there are ARM templates to spin up the the mining nodes and play with it. Oh, nice. Um, so Azure? there's yeah, it's on Azure. Um, mm -hmm. You can do it right now. Um, all the 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 code for doing Ethereum is all open source, as mm -hmm. is Bitcoin. Okay. Um, so yes, there, and that's just two of the blockchains I mentioned. There are others like R3 Corda, which is more Java oriented. There's IBM's Hyperledger, which uh, has its own permutation. There are a few of these out there right now, Excellent. but lots of resources. Are, are you uh, writing or speaking about this anywhere? Um, not lately, because we're okay. so heads down working on projects yeah. that we're trying to get those delivered. And uh, once we do, then we'll probably be a little more public. The only one for sure we've been really public about that went out as a case study was the one for WebJet in Australia. Mm -hmm. So if you do a search for WebJet blockchain, I'm sure you'll find it. Excellent. JD, thank you so much. You bet. Thanks for having me. This is a great week. There are so many of my friends. We're all hacking on technology. We're all together for one week in, uh, in CSE. And uh, I couldn't imagine a more fun place to be.